morning. Look at this, another beautiful day outside. Beautiful, beautiful day. Nice sunshine. We've got, look at this, the sun is actually right down the street today. Our street is not east and west. Our street is a little tip that runs, what's the word? East, northeast? No, no. West, northwest, and then east, southeast. Morning, good morning. Looking for a weekend here. Bars are going to be busy, nice weather. We had tons of rain yesterday, but uh, it's all done now. There was a monsoon rain right in the middle of the afternoon yesterday, but uh, it looks clear now. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yeah, uh, so, and it's chilly. I, I need to get uh, get warmed up. Starting, was it yesterday? Day before? I don't remember. Day before. Shirt sleeves are no longer enough. We're in the shop. I haven't put the heater on. They will probably... We're in that resisting time. They're going to want to put the heater on. I'm going to tell them, just, just bundle up. It's okay. We don't need this yet. I'm going to resist as long as possible. But uh, they're going to want to put the heater on, I think. Okay, what have we got? You know what we're going to be doing. It'll be mostly carving today. But uh, there's some other stuff on the desk here. <coughs> Prints. These are back from uh, this one. Remember this? This is oh, 10 years ago. It's 10 years ago, one of the really, really nice, simple design from Jed, effective, beautiful print. The simple ones are the best. This is from Mr. K, uh, Kawaii-san, not Kawaii Chiharu-san, the girl who's doing our Great Waves, but uh, Kawaii Atsushi. You maybe met him if you did a print party. He was one of our main print party hosts back in the day. This is fun. We'll look at this a bit later on. Let's start carving and uh, we'll come back and look at this a little bit later. This is really cool. I didn't realize this was upstairs. I should have showed it to you a few weeks ago when we were doing the tracing on the iPad. This is very relevant to that. I found it upstairs yesterday when I was putting some prints away. There's too much junk on the floor. Remind me, about maybe half an hour or so from now. We'll have a look at this. Will the Great Wave be available for online orders someday? I have no idea. I can't see such a future. I'm sorry. There are many, many thousands of people on the waiting list. We're still getting, the waiting list is growing. Five, six, seven, eight, ten a day sometimes. And we're only making now 60 copies, 57, 60 copies that I print every six weeks. So the waiting list is growing longer than it's shrinking. So I cannot see any way that we will have that print generally available online. I'm sorry. Paper is out, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, three people today. Uh, Yuki-chan's coming. She's doing some of the travelers, the little Don Quixote print that Taran-san carved last year. Uh, Ayumi-san is doing Yoshida, the Yoshida uh, boat, the daytime version. And who else is here? Oh, yeah, I know uh, Yoko-san, uh, Ishikawa-san. She's here. She's doing uh, the Castlevania print. Maybe Mokohankan should sell little waves from now on. Well, we've got microwaves, but I don't really know if we want to sell those. The Great Wave, the ripple. The Great Wave, it's funny, you know, I wouldn't have known it or realized it or guessed it, but it's coming, it's become, over the years, it's become one of the defining things of my life, and I'm afraid, maybe one day, X hundred years from now, you know, the little Wikipedia entry or whatever is there for Leftover Dave, the guy who made that great wave video. That's probably my legacy. Yeah, John could turn them out. <laughs> you can make a living. You want to make a living producing microwaves, you know. Okay, we know we got it. We're just going to open this and put it aside. This is from, we know who it's from. Who wants the egg? It's uh, it's actually funny what happened with this one. Of course, this is Kubota-san. We know eggs, eggs, eggs. We know this is coming back from Kubota-san. He's a super printer for us. He's I just I have nothing nothing bad to say about the guy. <laughs> he's 
the lead up here is that he's got some egg on his face at the moment with us. And he's, in his mind, he is screwed up kind of badly. And he's sort of, Dave, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's just done this job for us. One, I haven't seen it yet, but I know what they're going to look like. They're just fabulous. But while he was doing it, he kind of screwed up. We sent him. Usually what we do is we've got a master copy, a, mi, a mihon, a sample. And we keep the samples in a file, whatever. And when the printer gets the blocks, they get the sample print. It turned out that when we did this for Kabodasan, this would be about 10 days ago, I got the paper ready, did the sizing, the blocks were here in Asakusa. The sample file was in Omi. And he needed this tomorrow. And I had the blocks here and the paper here. So instead of getting our official sample from Ome sent over, I just jumped. I just grabbed one of the copies from the shop here. We've got the prints, you know, they're, they're, they're packed in the shop here. People walk away, I pick one and walk away. So I sent him the sample print from the shop and the wood blocks and the paper. Give him a chat, a little talk about this and this and this, the transparency of the glass, have a look at this, make sure we get this, blah, blah, blah. It's okay. He said, good, I'm on this, ready to go, goodbye. He sends it all back the other day, was it yesterday? Came in yesterday, I don't know, Thursday night it came in, along with an apology. What he had done was, he made the prints, right, let's have a look at them. That looks like the back side, let's flip it over. He made the prints, and of course, as usual, look at this, perfectly flat, drop dead, gorgeous, gorgeous prints. <laughs> it's enough to make you cry. This guy is so, so, so good at this. I am so proud of this. This is John Sands carving. There's no embossing in it, but I'm not going to do that today. We're going to move ahead for, for carving today. I'll come back later this afternoon when the shop's open and I'll do the embossing. I'm not going to put you guys through that now. But he's done this. Anyway, he's done his usual magnificent job. But what he had done by mistake was, because the sample we sent him wasn't a loose paper sheet. It was wrapped up, ready for sale in the shop. It was inside a plastic package. So he takes it out of the plastic package, of course, no problem, clips it up by the side of his bench. He's got some kind of a little stand, so the sample print is always right there on the bench. And then sometime, some way along when he was printing, I know exactly what's happened. I've done it myself many, many, many times. You reach for the pigment, He's probably watching TV at the same time. He reaches for the pigment, and the pigment is in the bowl. And it's got the little, uh, you know, the pigment is in the bowl, and it's got the little brush inside the bowl. I'm, I'm trying to mock that up here, you know. And as he reaches for it, he misses the little brush, and he clips the brush with his finger. And the brush flips out of the bowl, and bloop, goes onto the workbench. And the pigment that was in the bowl goes, bloop, a little bit of it splashes on the workbench. And if you've gone by and if you've hit this with your hand, boom, quite firmly, the, the brush goes, boom, it flips over. And actually, oh, you've got some little dots of pigment on your shirt and your face and whatever. And that's exactly what will have happened here. He flicked that thing and the little dots of pigment flew into the air and they scattered all over the surface of the sample print that was on his bench, you know, hanging up on his bench. So he had to call me and say, Dave, I've, uh, I've spoiled your sample print. And there's little spots of brown pigment on this here and there, everywhere. So the print has been destroyed. We can't sell this anymore. It's one, it's here, it's signed by Jed. It's number, uh, number 277, signed by Jed, and it now has little spots all over it. A hundred years from now, it won't make any difference. Nobody will care. It just looks like a nice antique print. Little spots of stuff on it. Who cares? But right now, I can't put it in the shop. So Kubota had to phone and apologize for what he's done. And you know what he said. Of course, you know, take it out of my salary. Take it out of my pay. You know, the print I've destroyed. And we're like, Kubota-san, my God, don't worry about it. Like, I'm going to penalize you for that, for working hard and quickly and making these prints. Don't sweat it. But we are. It's going to go into the reject pile. We can't sell it, and we'll, we'll do a write-off on it. Little fly poop. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guy, I don't, you know, every time I open these prints, I say the same thing. Just, I'm, he is so, so good. I will never, well, my day is done now. I will never be this good. I was a decent printer, but I was never, 
ever, ever. The, look at the gradation here, and then just look how similar they are, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And really, uh, it's not just me, I can never do this. He, we will, what's the expression? We will never see his like again. It's just not going to happen. Printmaking will continue, workshops like ours will continue, but the workers now, they just, of course, they're, they're different. Like me, we work lighter and easier. We do nice jobs, we do a good job, but we will never be the printing machines that we saw from this generation, like Kubota san And he's, he's the end of the line. It's been going on for a couple hundred years, of course. Yeah. He thinks of himself as being good, but oh my God, you should have seen the old guys, you know. So we will never see it again. Never, never, never. It's absolutely the end of an era. He's 70, 75, 76. I don't know. Okay, let's get to work. Let's get to work. One, one, one last thing. Anybody, how's, how's your Japanese reading? This was yesterday. It's a ticket. Got my name on it. David Bolt. It was yesterday. Anybody got it? Uh, is there a Japanese reader here? 12.50. Hmm? What do you mean? Doors open at 12.50. Performance begins at 13.30. That's not so hard to understand. Chickenmeister has got it at the very top. Of course, it explains what it is. I went to the ballet yesterday and had a fabulous time. Fabulous time. <laughs> Wheelchair Willie says sumo. It's ballet. It says right there. Nemureru mori no mejo. It's the sleeping beauty. <laughs> I can see the sleeping beauty with, with, with sumo actors. Sumo characters. Sumo version of the sleeping beauty. I've got this little needle for you. I had a great time. Absolutely great time. Staggering, staggeringly good performance. I am not a ballet expert at all. Absolutely at all. This would be, I don't know, in my life, fifth or sixth time I've seen a full, full performance. Incredible. Just, just astonishing. Don't blah, 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 blah. Why did I go? Why on earth would Dave have taken a day off at this point in the schedule? an afternoon off to go to the ballet. What would have caused that to happen? Double chocolate eggs to anybody who could guess that, but there's no way you're going to guess it. Oh, yeah, we've talked the story. So this was with the conductor who was almost late. Of course, he asked if some of us wanted to go. He arranged some freebies for us. Very, 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 very nice of him. And away we went. Sadako and I went yesterday afternoon, and some of the shop staff are going today. Tom, uh, the conductor who's here, I guess I did talk about him. The conductor who was here uh, very, very, very generously offered to, to comp some tickets for us. So. Fabulous, fabulous performance. Yeah. previous experience with ballet, you know, back when I was a, a, a young musician or a music student, of course, it was mostly orchestral music I was interested in, but the whole world, I was interested in the world of classical music, so I did have a chance to see a bit of ballet back then. We're talking 50, well, 45 or so years ago. And this was the second time now that I've seen a regular ballet performance here in Japan the kids once upon a time many many years ago we did the classical uh, the, the classic Christmas thing you know go to see uh, 
Nutcracker Suite at Christmas time. So I did that with my daughters many, many, many years ago. This was the first time just to uh, see it as an adult. And when I was watching it yesterday, one thing really struck me. He says, why, this isn't how I remember it. These people are actually that woman who just made her entrance then and started dancing. She sort of didn't actually walk across the stage. She somehow floated across the stage and then the orchestra started and she did her dancing and stuff. And I'm sitting there watching this again and again. And then a couple of guys come in and they do the standard ballet things. You know, this is very classical ballet, Sleeping, Sleeping Beauty. And it seemed like there was some kind of illusion happening where the people weren't actually walking around. I'm not being sarcastic here, you know, whatever. Somebody finishes, they do their bows, people clap, they do their bows again, and they, it looked like sort of there was something that was floating them off stage, not being picked up by wires, but, and people weren't moving in a, and I thought this was some kind of illusion if they've done this. It's marked as a, a special new production of this, so I thought they were doing something new. Okay, whatever, I, as I said, oh my God, these people don't, don't move and act like human beings. They're specially trained ballet dancers. So I was curious, last night, I, I came back, had dinner with Sadako, she went home, I'm doing some uh, work upstairs in my computer to get ready for the, the email that we sent out this morning. But as a side thing, I gotta watch some of this. So I went to YouTube and clicked up the prologue and act one of Sleeping Beauty done by the, the Mari, Marikov something ballet in Russia, whatever, just to sort of look again at some of the things that I had seen on the stage there. And I was astonished by what I saw. There's a scene there and some famous ballerina comes out and she clomps across the stage. Clomp, 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 clomp. Stand still, the music plays. This ballerina, it looked like a man actually, but big, huge woman in, the, in this tights and all that stuff floated around and did this and spun and then clomp, 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 clomp back off the stage. And I realized that what I had seen here in the theater was Japanese dancers, smaller, lighter, different from what we saw in that Russian ballet video. Very big people, the men were dressed in coats and doing this and trying to dance. And I guess this production is slim, light, delicate people really trying to do the float around thing. And what I had just seen, I guess, without really knowing too much about the background, was a, a kind of approach to ballet. I mean, even the entrances and exits were, these people just didn't actually walk like the rest of us, you know. And yet seeing the video, it was really quite different. The, 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 the Westerners doing this. You know? Maybe this is a no-brainer. This is something that people who know about this already know. The Japanese seem to be really, really, and I mean really good at this. We were entranced, just for further, what if it was three and a half hours, and absolutely we were entranced. Zoom in, can't we? Look at that. I'm sorry. Too busy blabbing. I forgot to zoom in. Just a minute. Let's get this right. Sorry about that. Where am I? Face the face to face. Sorry about that. Hi, hi, hi. All you have to do is tell me. Can we zoom in, please? Yes, I know. Sorry. Okay, we'll get started. Click the zoom button. <laughs> mm. 
we really do need a zoom button, don't we? It would be cool to have the, the camera movable. It, it's technically possible such things are out there, to have the camera controls adjustable by maybe the mods could do it, or, or there could be a situation condition where people following the chat each had a turn. Zoom in, zoom out, look at this, pan over here, pan over there. The camera could be controllable by viewers, I think. Would we want that? I don't know. Oh, good morning. That's Ishikawa-san heading upstairs. My conscience is clear. I did bring her paper out. Thanks for reminding me. If I had forgotten, you would have saved my life. She's doing such a nice job with her work, you know. Boy, oh boy, she's doing a nice job. She's very, very slow, but it doesn't matter. It gets done. It's funny, you think about this, Kawasana, she just come on the train, she's been on the subway, she comes, uh, she does mostly weekends, she doesn't do too many weekdays here, she only does two days a week, because of the tax laws, she can't do more than that, but, uh, it's really funny, you think about her sitting on the train, she spent the last half an hour sitting on the subway, coming over here, a normal lady, like a housewife type lady, or whatever, she's probably sitting there reading a book, or whatever, the idea is somebody on the subway, whatever, they're there, see this lady there, Okay, she's going shopping, she's going to an art gallery show, she's going to do this. How many of those people on the subway watching that lady just sitting there on the subway reading her book or something, how many would know that she is a top-class ukiyo printer? <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't understand this, you know. It's so rare what we're doing and what she's got, you know. Just crazy. Absolutely crazy. Mm. Are any of the printers working here interested in learning how to carve if they don't know how? Well, Ishikawa-san, she does her own carving. She makes her own woodblock prints as a hobby. So she does. She does carving the blocks and she prints the blocks. Her own, her own hobby stuff. I don't say hobby in a derogatory term. I'm just describing it. Her hobby is woodblock printmaking. So she, yeah, she does carving and she does printing. And in that sense, that's sort of the same level. Would she want to carve here? No, not at all. She, she, it would be pointless to start trying. It would be years before uh, it was delicate enough to do the kind of work we want, so it wouldn't be productive for her at all. And it wouldn't help at all. She's like, she's only maxed out with her income. A day chan, she's a cup, her partner is a carver, so a day chan's a printer, her partner, Chon san, is a carver. They're, they're set. They don't need to do anything. Ayumi san over at the other desk, she's a printer. She thinks of herself as a printer. I don't think she would have any interest in carving whatsoever. And again, no reason to. Certainly from Mokohankan's point of view, no reason. We're overloaded on carvers right now, and we desperately need printers. So there's no uh, impetus for me to do this. The other way around, Taransan, who you know, Saturday morning, he's probably listening, or maybe listening, he himself, and he's chatted with me about this a couple of times. He's a carver, but he has to think for his own future and his own life to be able to make a living as a carver you need either a corporate or company environment, like we have a workshop environment where there are printers to do the work. And if failing that, you've got to do it by yourself, like Dave did for 25 years. I was a carver, but by myself. So as a matter of just making a living, you've got to pick up the tools and become a printer. And this is in Tanan-san's mind too. At the moment, he's being paid here and he's hired as a carver, but that's just today. Tomorrow, this year, next year, as Mokohanka moves along, as I get older. So he obviously must be and should be thinking to protect his own interests, should he learn how to print as well. He's asked me about this, and I've said, don't you dare touch that stuff. Just keep away from it. You know, be the best carver you can be without getting involved in that stuff. But we both know the score. 
It's like Urushibara over in England a hundred years ago. He was a trained printer, but once he found himself in an isolated environment where there weren't blocks and a cargo around, he had to pick that stuff up himself. But he trained as a printer. Delicate stuff here this morning. See what we're doing. It's the guy's face, of course. I don't know if you can really see it clearly. His two eyes, which I'll hit next, and then the beard stuff down at the bottom. <laughs> Tune in for the first time. Dropped in shop today. Thank you. I don't know who you are, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Some, it used to be a men's profession. In the old days, all of this w was a man's job, of course. In, in the old days, certainly pre-war, uh, the printers and carvers were men. It was just a men's job. There was, no, there was no thought that women would be craftsmen in that sort of sense. For the most part, of course, women were doing uh, housework homework or, or work in you know, women's, uh, women's endeavors, you know, things related to clothing, cooking, whatever. So carving and printing was, of course, a man's job. These days, I don't know, Kaoko-san, what's her name? I don't know, san Kaoko-san. She's a, she's a fully trained carver. She's carved all the, all the Mitomura sound prints we have in the shop here. I don't know of any other female carvers at the moment, but uh, there's no reason on earth why women couldn't and can't do this carving. It's not a, it's not a bulky, heavy physical job. There's a hammer and banging, but there's absolutely no reason why uh, women couldn't do it. As far as the printing goes, there's a stamina a thing involved. The kind of scale of prints that we make ourselves of course women are completely capable of doing this. Some of the larger prints, the Yoshida type prints, the one I'm looking at now, the East Africa print, that's a very, 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 very physical hard job. I could not do that kind of work. I'm a male, but there's no way I could do that kind of printing, almost a meter wide, good, strong, thick colors on deep, uh, on, on thick paper. So there is a stamina level involved in the printing, depending on the scale and size of the work you're doing. And some of that would preclude women, it seems it precludes weaker 
uh, less less muscular people like me. You know. But carving, I don't think so. Well, see, it was, you know, again, this is a transition. It was only men who were doing this in the old days. And, uh, now it's more mixed. You know. The kind of work I'm doing now, my God, of course, absolutely, anybody can do this. There's no, there's no genre or gender or whatever, nothing. doing the eyes here, you know, if I go back 30 years or something to when I was doing this or the poet series, you know, the eyes for me were, were spectacularly difficult, you know, I'd save them for the end, I guess kind of like I have done with this guy, but whatever. And it was all a question of, Dave, hold your breath, oh my God, what are we going to do, are we in a good mood, and if I wasn't feeling just right, I'd put it off and come back to do it later, you know. The idea that I could sit there and carve some of these eyes with the stream going and chatting and whatever. It would have been, to me, it would have been, what? What? That's not possible. It's just a bunch of lines on the block. Make sure the knife is sharp, which it is this morning. Just cut the damn thing and don't sweat it. But yeah, the younger Dave, less experienced, would have been, oh my god, oh my god, hold your breath, let me set. Reminding me to show the rolled up paper thing. Just, just give me a couple minutes. I've done one eye here. I should do the other eye. So just give me a minute here. I should, I should pay at least lip service to the idea that we should focus on the work here. So I got you there. Just remind me. It's not that important a thing. It's just it'll be a, 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 a little, uh, a little uh, distraction from the stream. So just a sec.
Think back to yesterday's experience at uh, the ballet, and there's a few more things too that uh, I learned about all this. Uh, Tom, the, the conductor from Berlin, a British man living in Berlin, and Tom Seligman, he's the conductor of this, he's the one who got me the tickets. He and I had dinner the other day too, he's been, uh, he's been uh, hanging around here a bit, we had, had a good chat, had dinner together. He, he's only doing matinees, there's no evening performances of this ballet while they're in Tokyo here, so it's all matinees. So he's free in the evening. So he came over for dinner the other day. We chatted and, and, uh, and walked along the river for a while. And he told me some interesting things about this. And I had my own experience involved with orchestras when I was younger. I was going to be a flute player and I was going to be an orchestral flute player. So I got some experience. I've, I've sat in orchestras and played flute and played flute with, with orchestras as a soloist, all at an advanced student level. I never became a professional, but I was close enough to, to the world of all that stuff that I, I got, I, I, you know, got a pretty good uh, view of it and understanding of it and, and looking into it. And uh, he, he told me some things about the setup here. They, he comes in from Germany to do this and they have the first rehearsal and stuff like this and then, and then they have the rehearsal in the pit and he's like, wait, what? I don't exaggerate what he said. The pit is what it is and the musicians are in there. And he said, compared to his world in Germany and Europe where he's normally a guest conductor or an opera and ballet conductor all over the place, some huge differences. He said, over there now, huge focus on ear protection. The trumpets have these acrylic panels in front of them. There's something behind this and this, and there's there's these panels and setups inside the orchestra to to avoid the sound hitting other musicians. And he said, everybody, 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 everybody has plugs and they can talk to each other, but it stops the big blasts and stuff like this. And he said, here, nothing. There's no barriers inside the orchestra pit itself. There's no barriers when they did the rehearsal hall and none of the musicians are wearing protection. He's like, what? You're all gonna be deaf in six weeks. What happens to the, isn't, isn't the government, uh, you know, the, the workplace compensation safety people talking about this? And they're like, they've heard about this. And a lot of the musicians here, of course, have international experience. And they're like, no, we don't do that here in Japan. <laughs> and he's like, you have got to be kidding me. You know, got to be kidding me. So he said that's a huge, huge cultural difference uh, between the two, the two places that oversees everybody in the, in the world of orchestras and stuff is now extremely concerned with protection and here uh, basically nobody is. I was very, very surprised about that. You know. Well, surprised and yes and no. Japan sometimes, we tend to look at Japan sometimes as being, quote, behind the West, unquote, when it comes to, to social stuff like this, you know, to uh, uh, how Japan years ago treated handicapped people and having elevator access and stuff like this and workplace safety, you know. A normal workplace here in Japan now, the, the guys who are constructing something, oh my God, it's insane. There's safety men and belts and vests and chains and, and nets and stuff everywhere. But I guess in the world of uh, classical music, this hasn't, uh, hasn't soaked in yet, I guess. I mean, it's just one data point. Maybe some other Japanese orchestras are doing this, but uh, and this one that he's working with doesn't, and, and they didn't seem to be too worried and upset about it. But there was a, there was a, a side effect of this, in that he said, you know, when they were in the hall itself doing their dress rehearsals and the people were in the pit, he said it was just a blast. He couldn't hear, he couldn't think, just this, this orchestra thing. was. So he said, no, 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 down, 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 boy, down, boy. And I guess, I don't know the exact percent, half the volume, whatever, he said, we've got to cut this down. And there was resistance from, you know, the, the, the directors of the ballet or something. But it worked out okay. I sat there in the hall yesterday. I was about one third of the way back up. And I'd talked to him about this. I'd heard his comments that he was really dialing the volume of the whole thing right down as self-defense and the audience self-defense. I said, you can't, if the orchestra plays too quiet, I mean, you know, where's the drama? And he said, it works, it works, it works. And it did. I, I watched this last night for three and a half hours yesterday. And at first I thought, wow, this is kind of quiet. But then you get used to it. You're focused on the ballet. The hall is nice and resonant. The music is nice. And it wasn't in your face. You know? Yeah, talk about in-ear monitors, yes, so, so the world of rock music, my God, I, again, I, I fooled with this, dabbled in this when I was younger, but I never did it long enough to, I think, experience any long-term damage. 
my dad did. He was a student. He was a, a musician all his life. First in dance orchestras in Britain, and then in studio orchestras and uh, and stuff in Canada. And he clearly, towards the end of dad's life, he absolutely, absolutely, absolutely had stunning hearing damage, hearing loss, and he would never do anything. He would never go to the doctor about it. Never talk. No idea of a hearing aid. But he grew up in an area where there was zero protections, and he's a saxophone player sitting in front of the trombone. So, so my dad uh, absolutely lost, must have lost a huge percent of his hearing. I think I'm okay. I didn't do enough of it for a long period of time. But that, that was another interesting aspect to yesterday's experience, hearing orchestral music in a hall like that at, you know, a reduced volume level. And it was okay. It was fine. Okay, there's our two eyes. Almost certainly they will need some uh, trimming and adjustment when I can see them. At the moment I can't see them. I've cut them, but I can't see the real taste and mood of these lines. So once we've done a test printing, I'll be back here. Absolutely, I'll be back here on the face to uh, trim some of these a little bit thinner to maybe adjust the shape. Oh, I didn't get the beard here. Let's get in a few minutes. Anyway, let's look at that piece of paper first. There's the face. I don't think we can get it much closer without uh, losing the focus. Let's have a look. No, it's gonna not gonna focus clearly. There's our face. One more whisker group to do. Let's get that to where we here. So I'm saying with a precision and detail, could I, re could I replace something? It gets tough. It really, really does get tough. If I popped out something in there, I suppose I popped out his eyeball or something at that point, it would really get tough to replace because, you know, you can't dig out a big chunk. 
you could dig out the whole head and start again. That doesn't really help much. And what I've done in similar situations, I haven't ever screwed up something in the middle of a face like that. But when you're in the nitty gritty, when it gets down and dirty, what I do do and I have done is this, instead of trying to chop out a chunk and put a patch in, you drill a hole. You get a wood bit, the one that's got those, you know, like a metal drill bit starts with a V and then works its way into the metal. But a wooden drill bit has a point in the middle and then it's got an outer thing that slices the wood. So you get one of those drill bits and using your hand, not with the drzzz, no, just grabbing it by hand, tap with a really thin nail, tap a hole in the wood, put the drill bit into the hole and then rotate by hand, carefully, carefully cut and you cut yourself a round hole. And you do it like if I was trying to, if it was the eyeball that was broken, I would take out the whole eye, whatever, in, in a round hole. Just drill it down carefully, carefully, pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out. And you got yourself a round hole in the block. Then, of course, you get a plug, a, a little dowel, fix it, sand it, whatever, in it goes, and then you're good to go. So instead of trying to cut a square or a rectangle or inlay some wide thing. So in the case of really, really delicate areas where I'm fixing it, it's a drill, a hole and a plug, and you're good to go. Okay, a quick short diversion. For those of you who watched me trace this a while ago on the iPad, you've seen what I've done. I, I've got the, 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 the image in the iPad, I've got a trace layer on top, and I've got a white layer. So as I'm tracing something, I'm tracing on top, now and then I put the white layer in, we can see my trace lines, take the white layer out, do some more tracing, put the white layer in and fix up my trace lines. You watch me do that for a whole freaking month. The way I used to do it before an iPad is this. I found one of these upstairs yesterday. The print we were reproducing, and this was from my Sudivu albums. I went back, this is the 2002 or something like that. And the print I reproduced was this one. That's a Taisho era woodblock print. And then the version that I ended up making, it's in the, the books here somewhere. I should have got it all ready for you so I could just pull them out. Don't know where it is. Here we go. Here's the version that I made. And the way I did it, this is before Photoshop, before the iPad, before anything. I took the original print to a convenience store, color copy machine, set the uh, enlargement to 400%, which was the max that it would do, and printed it out. It won't go on one piece at 400%, so I ended up with, I forget, of course, this one, two, three, four, five. There would have been maybe six sheets of paper, whatever. Bring the six sheets of paper back to my workshop. On my old carving bench, I had the carving bench, I had an acrylic panel. I inlaid an acrylic panel in the middle of the carving bench to a piece about yay wide. And you know where this is going. I put a light bulb underneath the bench, helped keep me warm as well. And the, the tracing, not the tracing, the, the photocopy, pieces of the photocopy went on the bench and over top of them I used gumpy paper. And you can see this is pasted together. There was no way I could get gumpy paper this large. It was pasted together bit by bit by bit. And I traced it with all kinds of stuff. I used markers, I used pens. I didn't use an actual Japanese brush and dip in the ink and draw my beautiful lines because I don't have that skill. I just drew it with markers and pens bit by bit by bit by bit. So the, the lines and the taste, I was trying to make a, a taste of each one of these lines just sort of like you did, like you saw me doing with the iPad, but doing on paper. And I ended up with, with this. I don't know how big it is, whatever. And I did this for every single one of the prints in my Sudimono album series. So the 50 prints in that series, I have one of these at home for each one of them. Then the next step, as I told you, we talked about this the other day, I took this down to a local print shop, 
you know, a printing company. And they don't do this anymore. And maybe you'd have to really hunt around now because maybe a lot of companies don't do this. But at that time, they were doing architectural blueprints and stuff like this. So they had a massive, massive thing. This went to them. It went inside and uh, they had a, a plastic cover. You put this inside, it closed it up, and then they fit it into their machine from the head. And the machine rolled it. And out came the copy. But it also did reduction. And I would do the measurements and tell the guy, Tanaka-san, who runs the place, I need this one at 17.258%, please. He's like, the first time I did this, he's like, 17.258%. What are you talking about? Goes, he thought I just wanted a copy at that size. And no, I reduced it down. And I gave him my sheet of patented gumpy paper on top. He put it in the machine and away it went. And he and I did that. I took mine down there every, every, uh, every month for the five years that I was doing that. So for those of you who don't like the idea of iPad, you want to trace or whatever by hand. And you can also see what I did with the hair here. I didn't try and draw all the hairs. What I did was I put a marker down. I drew the nose properly. I drew the eyes properly. I tried to get taste. Look at this. This is Dave with a little marker and, and, and illustration pens drawing this. The bottom of the eye has a nice taste, the left eye. Because at the scale we're doing this, I can do this. But the hair, I didn't try and do that. I just drew a marker. One, two, three, four, five. There's where we do your hairs. Because that's where the knife comes over. The knife, I just needed to know where the hairs are, not the taste of them. And here's the print. Here's, there's my copy. And did I catch the same mood in the nose and eyes that I did on the tracing? Nope. But at the scale we're doing, that's all I could do at the day. So it's funny, actually interesting. The tracing here, where is it? The tracing, her eye, the bottom line of this. Ooh, ooh, ooh is better than what I was actually able to do. And two, this is 2002. I still wasn't really good at hair carving. Even though I marked them here, look at this. It's not delicate enough. I still wasn't good enough at this. But there we are. So that's how I did those prints. All traced at, for the most part, 400% enlargement, and then traced, and then carved. And somewhere, these are all over in Omic. They're in boxes scattered all over the place. Some of them are nicely uh, rolled up in a group. Some of them are in a box. I don't even know where they are. I guess one day they get thrown away. I don't know. But that's how I did it before the iPad came along. That's two pieces, uh, two, two pieces of paper, three. I can't remember. Okay, how's our time? 8.53. What are we going to be doing later today for show and tell? I didn't actually think about that very carefully. There is a box here, so we have something for show and tell. I don't quite remember what it is. It's a box that's been ignored. That was a good one last time. That Tokaido set, the mailman happened to bring it. My God, that was a nice set. That's gone upstairs to Watanabe-san. And when she saw it, she was just like, ooh. Today's show and tell will not be so spectacular as that. Do I remember the month in 2002? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. Was that the second print in the series? If it was, it would have been February. I don't remember. Okay, let's finish off that face. Whiskers, whiskers, whiskers. What's the question here? Someone's asking something. Did I find any foxing? No, that set we opened up on the last show and tell. It seems to be, I went through the whole thing. As soon as the show and tell was finished, I got my coffee, turned all the cameras off, got out of here, and eagerly went through the rest of that set. It's complete, it's full, it's wonderful. They're not all, and I think I highlighted some of this. Look at that beautiful gradation, blah, 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 blah. They're not all master, <coughs> they're not all masterpieces of printing. It's good. 
It's good solid work for its era. It's excellent. It's, they're not the greatest, most glorious Tokaido prints that have ever been made, but it's a very, very, very good set. And no damage, no foxing. You'll see it appearing in the flea market, whatever, some months down the road. That was a good one. They're not always good ones, but that was a good one. They're rarely good ones like that. It's funny too, after we looked at that print set the other day and I realized it was such a nice one, I'm chatting with and somebody asked me, what about that auction, Dave? Was that an auction where you got scammed or whatever? And I hadn't remembered, so I went back to look at it, look at the auction there, and actually it was really, really unusual. It was an auction that was fairly late in the evening. The guy who put it up had put it up late, and so not many people were there and not many people were bidding, and he had done something really, really unusual for Yahoo Auctions. The guy who uploaded that one set it so that the time did not extend after bidding. In other words, it was snipeable. No matter what bids come in, at what time, the ending time of the auction doesn't change. And I noticed this. And you, you have to, because 99% of the auctions on Yahoo are not snipeable, we tend to forget it. But I noticed this. I took the time and trouble to check, saw that it was snipeable, and that's it. That's game over. I ended up getting the print set. But it's really, really, really rare. For their own interests, most sellers set it to extend the time after the next high bid. Because, of course, it just lets prices go up and up and up. So I don't know why he did it, but uh, I'm going to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and I will laugh all the way to the bank. That's not always how it goes, but whatever. You win some, you lose some. I've still got all the uh, the Sleeping Beauty themes running through my head, you know, all the music that we, we all know so well because it's such sort of, quote, hackneyed, unquote, classical music. But uh, when you see it on stage, the actual performance, you see how the music fits with what's going on in the story, and it, it makes much more sense. And, and that reminds me of another thing, the, you know, the orchestra itself, we talked about the volume and stuff like that. But there was something else very, very interesting about the, about the orchestra. And Tom had mentioned this when we were chatting about it. I'd been asking him, how, how are the Japanese orchestras different from what you're used to in, in Germany and whatever? You know? And he had talked about things that he felt were differences. And yesterday, I really, really felt that. 
the, the string section, the violins, you know, the violins are an ensemble, flutes, whatever, everybody's got their own part. Flute one has his music, flute two has his music, whatever, you're individuals in any orchestra. But the string section, you know, it's the, the viol violins first, violins second, violins. So you get, I couldn't see the, the pit, it was too deep, but you got like 10, 12 people playing the same part. And it was astonishing, you couldn't tell it was 12 people. All the phrases, anything in the violin stuff, whether they're playing the waltz themes or whether they're just doing anything, it just sounded like one person. And with no joke, at times I thought, there's no way. This is something, there's not an orchestra in there. There's, it's a keyboard thing or something, or it's all on tape, because there's no way that 12 people can play that exactly together. Dee, 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 that's okay. But boo dee doo boo doo dee doo when you hear the strings do this, it doesn't go boodle-doo-doo, they're all So you hear the, the, the round notes all together, and then you hear and then they come back next round. It's a normal way orchestras work these days, whatever. These guys are not like this. Every single phrase, everything, whether it's a big whole note or a half note or a chord note or a 30-second note, they were absolutely identically, robotically together. And that's where the criticism comes in, that obviously these Japanese musicians have trained and trained and trained their ensemble, and the criticism might be they're just robots. They are, they're just pushing their buttons and they can do it all together because there's no individuality. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to take sides on this one, but fantastic. The, the ensemble of the strings was just fantastic. I've never, ever heard anything like that. I've been in and around orchestras all the first half of my life, listening to music everywhere. This was an astonishing experience, absolutely astonishing. I know, precision walking, precision this, groups this, I know, I know, I know, I know, but whatever. There's stuff they're good at. Tom did talk about this. It says Uber, somebody's mentioned this. Understand, Uber here in Japan is different from what it is everywhere else. Uber here does not mean some dude in his own car who has picked up something on his phone and he's coming to pick you up. Uber is just the brand name they've tied together with one of the real taxi companies. They are taxis, they're licensed taxis, licensed drivers, white gloves, the door opens automatically. Uber here is not the Wild West thing that it is in other countries. Anyway, anyway, another sidetrack, another sidetrack. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. Okay, now decision time. We've done, we've done our first of the three strange dudes. I started with the hibachi and the bag on the floor, worked through this guy's feet, kimono up to his time his head. The first guy is done. Where shall we go next? It's November the 18th. I've really got to get moving forward to this. The print has to be delivered to the subscribers in the first week of January. Okay, let's just move across the bottom. Let's hit the next shoe, work our way around, and just keep going. Yeah, someone says leftward from the pot. I think that makes sense. We'll save the guy in the middle. He's pretty isolated anyway. We'll save him for last. Let's just chew along. Uh, somebody else said, that was another idea. Follow the pipe upstairs. You know, Follow the pipe. I don't want to start with the guy's head, though. We could do that. Follow the pipe, start with the head, back to his body. I'm going to do the other round. We're going to start with the shoe. We'll work our way through his body, and we'll just follow it up. Then we'll do the neck. Around we go, and we'll link up with the pipe. <laughs> Two more weeks. Ha, 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 ha. Did we get the nine o'clock? I wasn't watching. I'm sorry. I don't see it. In fact, I don't have times on my uh, my chatter. Doesn't show times. So, uh, whatever. <laughs> what wood? This is boxwood. 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 Not the greatest boxwood in town, but there's no way we could do this kind of a carving, this kind of carving on the cherry wood that we have available to us these days. It's just not possible. windy. Well, yes, it is. It's getting gusty and windy. It's more like spring weather, you know. What we had this yesterday, we had gusts of wind and gusty rain, and it felt like March. Absolutely, it felt like March. 
It can't be true that we've like, we missed our autumn and have we missed winter and jumped straight to spring? I don't think so. It's going to be getting cold here soon. But it has the feeling of March. The noise out there, construction noise, wind noise. There's another thing about yesterday's trip to the ballet as well. <laughs> In the morning, I had to head over to Donkey there, and I had to buy some socks. I know I'm, I'm not that much of a of a philistine that I would head over to the ballet here in the, in bare feet. You know, I may not be the most fashionable guy in town, and I'm a bit careless with my stuff. Good morning. Oh, what's that? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's the trip? The train. Not bad. Okay. How about last night getting home? <laughs> no trouble at all. Oh, okay.
How's our time? Ten minutes. Okay. Show and tell coming up in five more minutes. So, right. <clears throat> Do the rickshaw drivers come down this street? No, they come down here all the time. This is one of the main routes for the rickshaw cart drivers, absolutely, for a few reasons. They like to come past our shop. They, they tell their viewers about the famous rickshaw cart design that we have hanging outside. And another reason they come down here, not just because it's a famous street, because there's the, the famous empty sign waiting for Beat Takeshi's name. And that's one of the highlights of their trips. They stop in front of the empty street sign and they quiz their passengers. Look at that, that one's empty. It says reserved you know, for somebody else coming. And they quiz their passengers. And the passengers are like, how do I know? I know nothing about old comedians. And the drivers give them some kind of hints, of course. And then they all realize, oh, it's for Takeshi. And it's a famous story. One of the pictures, I think we can actually see it from here. Unless, it's, unless we can't. The, the lights here, where is it? Yeah, well, you, you can't really read it and see it, but uh, right in the middle of your screen there, there's the two white flags flapping, and in front of the blue building, just to the right of the blue building, the comedian sign has no picture of a comedian in it. It says, reserved, and it's the story everybody in the district here knows, of course. It, they wanted to put Takeshi up there, across the street from the guy who was his shisho, his, his uh, master, his mentor. And the story is that he told him, no way, I'm not dead, you're not going to put me up in a, in a decoration space of old, revered masters, whatever. So they said, well, we want to put you up there. And he says, no, over my dead body. So they said, okay. And this is the story. And it's up there, it says, reserved, Yoyakuzumi. And the description at the bottom says the same thing. And the rickshaw cart drivers all stop there and talk about it. Wow. There are dozens, Sadako. Get dozens. busy. Get busy. <laughs> you can't do them all. Wait till the girls get here or whatever. Who else is coming? And a lot of them may be set aside in a separate place because one Nabisan, you know, put them aside. aside. I don't really know because I wasn't here yesterday, so I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean, this long story short, he said of my dead body, so they said, okay, so it's there. And uh, whatever the day after, it must be all prepared. The picture must be ready. And uh, once he's gone, that will be his, uh, his notice board. He cut his teeth on this street, uh, the theater at the end. It used to be called the uh, Franceza, was the strip club around the, outs around the corner. And that's where he started work, uh, as a comedian working between the strippers. I guess we've used up our time, have we? I don't really know. 13, 15. The music you heard in the background at the moment, this is our, our shop alert system. We've talked about, talked about this before. We have goods prints online, and we also sometimes have the same print in the shop. And that's the potential for disaster. If somebody in the shop, a customer buys the print, takes it to the cash register and buys it, the print is still online. And we can't wait like till the next day till Ayano-san gets here or something like this to, to take it down. We don't want people buying online and the same thing at the same time. So what we have is whenever our system recognizes that something has sold here in the shop, it immediately takes it down online. But we have to do the same thing the other way around. Once something sells online, the shop staff has to hear about it so that they can take the print so that nobody grabs it. And that's what you're hearing for that music. We needed something loud that tells the shop staff, hey, quickly, come and look at the computer, look at the email, see what's happened, and get that print out of sight so that nobody else can grab it. And that's what you heard just now. Sadako has the list of orders that have come in during the night, many of which for flea market items, and she has to start getting them out of the shop. Okay, we get a bag and we get a box here. Let's see what's inside. Right. Too much stuff on my desk here. Mm. 
I'm avoiding coming near the computer here. I don't want to take down the flask because you know what happens if I start fooling around with a flask here, we'll lose our video. Oh, that is awesome morning. Okay, let's get into this thing. My knife, can I reach the knife without hitting the cable? Looks at, go. I don't think we're going to get recyclable plastic here. Let's have a look. No, let's just cut. Let's just cut. It's not going to recycle in. So how many layers today? I don't know. Let's see. Oh, if, you've, if you're if you counting on a high layer, I think you're in trouble already because I think it's going to come out just like this. When I say recycle that plastic, what I mean is keep it in enough good shape that we can simply use it again. I don't mean send it to the recycle bin, I mean actually reuse it. And if they put too much tape on it, we just can't get it open. And by the time it's opened, it's just all spoiled. We've had a bit of shipping damage here, maybe. Have we? I didn't notice anything. Here, let's go. So I think we're in. I think it was one and done this time. Let's have a look. Oh, no. I don't know, it depends on you know how you're going to count this. That box is actually part of the product that we bought. So that box wasn't really packaging. So there's packaging inside the item. Okay, we have. Oh, I've forgotten his name. I need help reading this. Etane, the famous painter, uh, made late Meiji era. Can you, it's, yeah, maybe you can read this. I've forgotten the guy's name. It's, it's not strange writing. Where? Here. Kono. It is. Kono Baide. Baideo. Bai. Ryo. Not Bei? Baide. Baideo. Either okay. way. Okay, there is okay. a famous guy. Kono Baide. There is a Baide. famous one. So okay. that would be this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is Kacho Ga Hu. Hu. Mm. Ga Hu. Mm. Collection of prints of mm. flowers and birds. Got it. This is not ancient old handwriting, of course. It's a modern set. Kono. Baideo. Ko, kono or ko? Kono. Kono. Baideo. Mm, kono. Okay, Sometimes thank you. kono. Ka, kono. So, 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 either so, 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 so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, so many orders. So, she's got, he's got a, she's happy. There's a whole list of things she has to do this morning. <laughs> you can hear her voice. She's happy about this. So, so, so. So I think I'm remembering this as by day. Maybe the other pronunciation is also acceptable. I don't know. This is a, a set of prints. There's good news and bad news. It's a nice set of prints and birds, but the bad news is it's not actually all here. And I, it's it's on me. This was a, an item in Yahoo Auctions. And the guy was, I have to say, he was a little bit tricky. He put the set up, set of four flowers and bird pictures. And what you're supposed to do, of course, is say one missing. He didn't do that up on the title. He just put set of floor, flower, flower, oh, so flower and birds, blah, 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 blah. And Dave eagerly looked at it, and it was a few minutes before the auction finished. I didn't have a whole lot of time to do this, so I clicked, click, click. The pictures looked good, looked like no foxing. He had a picture of the couple of them, two of them that were inside, so I just bit on it. When I got it, as you're about to see, there is one, two, Three. There is one missing because I had noticed when you get to the bottom of the small type, he says, oh, by the way, it's not a full set. One's missing. But it was in tiny, tiny, tiny type at the bottom. So whatever. So it's good news and bad news for us. Uh, the bad news is it's a broken set. The good news is that because it's a broken set, we don't have to keep it as a set. These will end up in the shop. One by one by one. This is published by uh, Unsodo. And the date would be, this is post-war. We have their catalog. Is there a date? 
sponsored by Diners Club International. Interesting. Look at this. Hey. Look at this. I don't see a date. This is not that old. 1980s, possibly 1990s, I don't know. 1980s, maybe that's where I plant my flag. And of course, they are reproductions in woodblock print of watercolor paintings. So the original was a painting. These guys have done, uh, they've taken it into woodblock. So every different green here, they've attacked his painting and tried to decide. And I, I can't just do the analysis right here. As I said, there's a lighter green, uh, a medium green, a darker green, a gradation on some of it. So maybe with two blocks, maybe with three blocks, I don't know. The, the gray and blue on the bird, they've broken it down into, into parts. And here's the mark. It's un sodo ba. And it's going to come out and we can have a look at it. So the idea here is not to make a woodblock print. It's a different process than what you've seen me doing the last few weeks. Tracing out lines, carving lines, making a, an ukiyo-e type print. This is using woodblock as a reproductive mechanism. They didn't want the finished product to look like a woodblock print. They want the product to look like a watercolor painting. And if you, for example, had put this in a frame somewhere, put it up on a wall, and asked people to come up and look at it, there would be people who would not be able to tell that it was a woodblock print. Those of us in the business, we can do this. And this hasn't gone to the hundred blocks level. They've only done this with a dozen or so blocks. So it is clearly a woodblock print. But the goal is to reproduce masterworks by this famous artist. And we can see what they've done. This is interesting. I've not this is the, the, the Diners Club is the sponsor here. <coughs> Uchida, uh, Unsodo is the manufacturer. And there it is. For the set of four of these, 28,000 yen. And this would have been at a time when the exchange rate was, I don't know, nowhere near what it is now. 100 to 100 or something. So this would have been like $300. Nowadays, 28,000 yen is more like $180. This one would confuse you more. If you didn't know that it was a woodblock print, I think this one. They very like the top okay, you can get this up easily. If you didn't know this one was a woodblock print, it would give you some second thoughts, I think. This guy was famous, of course, I don't know, I don't know, I forget the exact years. He's in Meiji, it's the uh, 1880s up till the early 1900s. And birds and flowers was his thing, absolutely. I don't know the printer. This would be a Kyoto printer, uh, somebody I never would have met. What does it say? It's Taken, Takenaka? I don't know, I don't recognize the name at all, I'm sorry. I don't recognize the printer's name at all. We've got them on the uh, on the pamphlet. They're introducing the craftsmen. We have Ogura Hambe, who was working in Tokyo, and we have it's Takenaka, I guess Takenaka. I don't know him at all. I know nothing about him. My guess is he would be a Kyoto printer because Unsodo is a Kyoto company, but uh, I don't know. So there we have an idea, you know, woodblock prints can look like woodblock prints, they can look like ukiyo-e, or they can be used to, to reproduce items from a different, com completely different uh, genre. Someone says, Takenaka Sei Hachi, it's something Hachi. I myself can't read it, I'm sorry. I don't know the name. It could well be Takenaka Sei Hachi. So they're whispering, they're trying not to disturb us. Sadako and Nakazawa-san are busy trying to find the orders and get the stuff ready and get it out of the way of the shop. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're trying to be polite to us. Okay. 
Okay, unfortunately, it's only three prints here, not four prints, so we don't have four to show you, just the three. But these will be moved over and they will be appearing in our shop. If it had been a full set, there you go. Somebody's got a link. Look at this Takesasa company, a Kyoto company. They're a young company in Kyoto doing pretty good work now and then. Not so pretty good work now and then. And I guess that's one of their printers, Takenaka Seihachi. Thank you very much for the link. I don't know this person. Okay, we'll leave it there, I think. We've come to the end of our stream here this morning. Let's pop up the outside the camera and have a look. It's going to be a nice day. It's going to be very, very crowded outside. Once it gets going, it's going to be a big for the bars today. Yesterday was rainy, and this weekend looks good. Okay, I have a ton of work to do here now. I'll be back two more days. You know exactly what we'll be doing for all the next streams coming up for the next few weeks for sure. I'll be carving on the uh, on that uh, upside reproduction. So, see you then. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks very much. I'll see you now in a couple of days on Monday morning. Look at the breeze. With masks, without masks, we had a real good mix. It's 50-50, I think, masking these days. I don't know. Maybe it's the older you get. The older people seem to be wearing masks. I did yesterday all day. And the younger people don't care so much. Okay, saying goodbye from Saksa. Three, two, one, away we go. <laughs>